Oh. <laughs> All right. So um, some of you guys may have noticed at the front we've got a computer. Um, that's because we are streaming regionally to some of our members as well. So hello. Right. They can see us and hopefully they can hear us all okay as well. Um, hello to you guys around the corner. If there's anybody that can't hear us throughout the night, just let us know. Just chuck up your hand and just let us know. Or if anybody wants to come in a little bit closer, we've got some cushions and stuff. So you can come and get nice and cozy and cuddly with us in the cold. Can I sit down there? Yeah, sure. That's the name of yes, thank you. Um, so my name is Jessica Harlan Kenny. I'm the new project development officer with uh, Hotel Youth Arts. Um, so if anybody is 12 to 26 and have got a project that they'd really like some assistance with, then we've got our Y Culture and Metro. In the bags that you guys have got, there's some little flies about that to help you um, apply for that and come and see me for any information. If anybody's an artist and they want to register their interest for different workshops that we run or anything like that, please be in touch with us. So our email address is very easy for all of us. Um, it's just whatever our first name is at propel.org.au. So mine is jessica at propel.org.au. Jamie, our marketing, is here looking after the uh, live stream, jamie at propel.org.au. And if you just want a general inquiries, it's hello at propel. Dot au. Dot au. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so in your little packs, you guys will also find one of these. So this has got a little bit about each of our panelists, so I'll do a brief introduction for you in a moment as well. And on the back, if you want to leave any notes or anything like that, that way we're helping to recycle and you don't throw these people out straight away. Um, the other thing, some housekeeping for tonight. If anybody does need to go to the bathroom, it is back through that door, or if you're there, you could also go out and head around. Considering you go past windows, everyone will know that you go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but the bathrooms are just through there on the other side of the courtyard. And there is uh, paper cups and some jugs of water if anybody does need to have a drink throughout the night. Tonight is a really casual atmosphere. We want you all to feel welcome and comfortable here. So if you do need to get up and grab a glass of water, if you're having a bit of a cough or anything like that, feel free to do so. Um, and the same if you want to move forward. Uh, right. So tonight, can everybody please make sure their phones are on silent as well? Yeah, yeah you have to come up here and tell us a tall story. So if your phone goes off, he's got to tell us a tall story about how there's a dinosaur that's trying to call you because his shoes are too small or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> should be a test of creativity. Yeah. Well, at an arts talk, it should be. <laughs> um, in terms of your interaction for tonight as well, so that we cover what you guys are here to hear, um, the first hour is just us soaking it up and telling you what we know and what we think you guys are going to be interested in. And then the second hour of it is where you, we open up to you guys and you guys are free to ask any questions about our favourite kind of um, artwork or our favourite cups of tea or, or anything to do with business and arts as well. As you can tell, I'm hilarious tonight and you're in for some comedy gold as well. <laughs> um, okay, in the packs that you guys have got as well as part, part from those little um, flyer sheets, you've also got a notebook from Jeff and he's brought that in from his accounting firm, which is Edwards, Irvine and Fascist? Not Fascist, well, <laughs> close to Fascist. Fascist. Fascist as in Fascist. Ah, Fascist as in Fascist. That's much nicer than Fascist. <laughs> um, right, so why are we all here tonight? Um, as I understand, you guys have all come through because you guys are artists, so within the arts admin um, or arts, arts management arenas, and you want to know a little bit more about how to come into business, how to make that transition from having a passion, a desire, um, and transition that into a full-time work form, or making yourself a bit of money, or survival. Um, when do you make that transition? When do you decide that you are going to be a full-time real deal artist? When do you decide that maybe it's too hard and you've got to quit and get a real job? Um, it goes through my head a lot of the time as well. Um, when you do make that decision, is it just a sudden turn in the road or is it something that gradually happens and you wake up one day going, hey, I'm actually making some money from this? Is it just about money? What do you count as success and how do you measure your success? I'm asking a lot of questions and that's my job tonight. I'll be asking a lot of questions tonight of these guys up here. As well as this being a forum for you guys to listen understand and ask questions for yourself. This is also an incredibly um, important networking experience. Everybody just have a really quick look around 
at the moment you're surrounded by energetic, creative people who are inspiring and willing and ready to collaborate. Whether it's through a collaborative conversation over a coffee, or whether you actually get into the room with each other and start designing something. Perhaps you're from two completely different forms. Um, I encourage you guys to use tonight as a way to network as well. Ooh, okay, so let's get started a little bit. Let me introduce you to our fantastic panel. So first of all, I'm gonna jump across a little bit because that's what my notes are looking at. We're gonna turn to Jeff Edwards first. So from uh, Gracious. <laughs> So Jeff Edwards is our tax and accounting man. Um, he came recommended to us from artists within the industry and also from um, our alliance, uh, our union as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. There you go. Oh, I know who that was. Tiff. How much did it cost? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jeff has 20, sorry, 38 years experience within the financial uh, industry, services industry. Um, and with his accounting firm, has been there for 29 years. Is that yeah, correct, Jack? Yeah, and Mark at the back, 27 years. Hey, fantastic. <laughs> and, you're, and you yourself are the sole director as well? Is that what I've, yeah. that's what I've got down yeah. here too? Beautiful. And um, so Jeff says that he's passionate about his work and cares about his clients. A satisfying day for Jeff is having achieved outstanding results for his client. And he also enjoys good wine. Maybe that's how he... <laughs> the art... Film, walking, and if you can't find him at work, you'll find him at the airport, and he just got back from Bali. <laughs> Rub it in, Jeff. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, next on our panel, we have Jamie Wosley, our artist on our panel tonight. Now, of course, um, we have some other artists who have transferred their um, fields of work, but Jamie is here as our artist. Jamie is a light artist, as he describes himself. Um, some of you guys may have seen the... Is it Pillar Rats or Pile Rats? Pile Rats. Pile Rats. Pile Rats video that Jamie we posted um, in promotion for tonight as well. So Jamie, it was born in Sydney, and in Sydney he in 2006 he completed a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Sydney College of Arts. He's a skilled glass blower, but as I said, considers himself um, as a light artist and is predominantly moving towards glass uh, cutting and polishing skills. Yeah, that's what. We, yeah, there's you lean towards the side. Yeah, okay. Glass. Glass, glass, glass takes a long time to master any form, okay. a lifetime. So. Um, and if we ask very nicely in a little while, Jamie may show us his circular breathing as well. We get a <laughs> <laughs> Um Jamie has also, I feel, done something quite different with his work, um, with his passion with computer games um, and yeah, digital graphics, mm. is that how we say it? Um, has started to create some really modern pieces of work that um, are quite unique to his industry. And, and he's incredible enough to have sold each piece of his work and featured his work in a lot of galleries. Oh, that sounds promotional. A lot of galleries. <laughs> cool. Okay, then we move on to... Oh, wait. <laughs> Sitting to my right here, we have Gemma Weston. Gemma, can I ask you to describe this sentence, to explain this sentence a little bit further for us? Um, in your bio that you sent through to us, you said you're interested in collaboration and divisions of labour and value in art, which you explore through text, research and exhibition. Well, I have a really hard time describing what it is I do. So for 50% of my time, I work at Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery as the curator of the Cobbers Collection of Women's Art. But because it's a part-time job, I also do a lot of freelance writing and I curate ex exhibitions independently. And I also sort of went to art school and had very good intentions about being, being an artist, which hasn't necessarily happened in the way that I, I expect to so at the moment I kind of try to try to balance all of those things so the best way that I can I can I have found to describe what I do is to stay my interests rather than my activities um, so and what I've done, worked a lot on in the past is on collaborations and the kind of thinking sort of I suppose critically about the the way that the art industry divides itself or divides itself up in terms of value and in terms of labor so the difference between art and craft the difference between, especially with my work a lot of this, the difference between women's labour and men's labour and how those things are valued. So there's all these kind of interesting divisions that happen in the arts between being a curator, for example, or an administrator and an artist. And those sort of divisions are what interests me and those are the sort of things that I carry through all of my activities and all of my different hat wearing um, 
capacities. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, and that's something that you've written about with um, some of your publications with Arts in Australia, Un Magazine, Artlink, the West Australian. Mm. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. It's me. Cool. All right, and that's something that we're going to cover on um, and look into a little bit further as we go through. But also, while well, we're talking about Gemma, Gemma co-directed OK Gallery in Northbridge, um, which closed in 2013, opened in 2011 and closed in 2013. Um, and as she said as well, she's the curator at the Covers Collection of Women's Art. Uh, women's Art at the University of Western Australia as well. It is. <laughs> um, and you uh, graduated from Curtin University with a Bachelor in Arts in 2016, that's uh, 2006, with first mm -hmm. class honours as well. Yep. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, now skipping over again to this other side, Brian Child. Um, in probably about a 10 minute conversation on the phone with Brian Childs, he schooled me in my own uh, arts practice and arts business. This is a straight down the line kind of man and he's got the um, experience to back him up in that as well. So he's been teaching uh, 8,000 plus people in intensive workshops and training programs and addressed over 25,000 people at speaking engagements. Uh, in 1984, he developed the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme, and in 1990, the federal government partnered with Brian to clone the West Australian model across Australia. The program launches over 6,000 new businesses annually. Um, he's got decades in solving business problems, teaching, advising, and helping experienced and new business operators to plan, build, and grow their business. Um, so hopefully, just like I was schooled in that 10-minute phone conversation, we'll all get a bit of schooling tonight as well. Brian Cup. Okay, and last panelist here tonight, I am terrible at pronouncing her last name. I'm going to give it a crack, but I tried it last time and got it completely wrong. But this is Dunya. Romantic. What, Romantic? Yeah. Yeah, Romantic. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so right now, Sonia is a um, curator, a writer, a project manager, sorry, a curator, a writer, a collection and project management specialist, an arts researcher, um, and then specialising in arts management as well, as well as art history lecturer. Um, she's currently working as the Associate Curator of Projects at the uh, Art Gallery of Western Australia, right up there, if anybody doesn't know it, you should know it. Um, she's worked in public and private galleries, most recently as the Curator of Collections at Davenport Regional Gallery in Tasmania, um, and has been on the board of the King's Artist Run Initiative. She's got a Master of Arts Curatoric, cur 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 that one, <laughs> at the University of Melbourne um, and a Bachelor of Arts with, again, first class honours in arts history. Ching ching. Cool. So this is our panel tonight um, and I'm sure you guys can all agree we've been very lucky to have um, this panel donate their time for us tonight. So let's crack on with it. Um, can we open, if any of you guys have got some first thoughts about why tonight was important to you to come and share? Who wants to jump in first? I'm happy to be first kick off the rank. Yeah, tonight. great. My view is that everyone here comes with a strong creative background. You are driven by the desire to exploit your natural creative talents and simultaneously the commercial imperative exists for you to find enough to pay for the groceries so you can eat three times a day. That's my entry assumption, and I'm right. Yeah. Good. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to come free because they want me to talk as well. I think it was a bonus. <laughs> so a guiding principle that I'll be articulating throughout the night. And by the way, I have a cold and a little bit hoarse in my throat. If I run out of voice, just forgive me for a moment. <clears throat> but the guiding principle that I'll be articulating to you throughout the night will be your creative talent is your natural propensity, your natural desire. However, you must find a way of making a commercial living out of it, and that is the challenge that we face. You face it individually, I face it as an advisor, the other panellists will face that challenge. And there are mechanisms and solutions available to you to become a commercially feasible artist if you're prepared to take the mind shift, the mind shift, the mind shift. Did I mention mind shift? And by the way, mind shift from being full-time creative artist into part-time business owner and part-time business artist. And that is a fundamental 
catastrophic shift for you. It takes a real crashing change of direction to move from the dedicated artist into being a part-time artist, part-time business person, because all your training and all your experience has been very much about developing the creativity. At the end of the day, if you've got more money coming in than going out, you will find happiness. If you have more money going out than coming in, you will suffer distress. That's my view. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Does anybody else want to add to that or change anything? Yeah. Sure, I can't oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now we're going live. <laughs> well, uh, I, I kind of think everyone thinks of it differently in, in this world as well. Like I, I have moments where I'm broke and can get me cash and get a real job. Why do I, I mean, I relief teach on the side. I did my bed last year to help fund my art because working in a video store, they all just disappeared. So <laughs> I've worked in video store for 14 years. I love film. I've always loved my film. I've always loved my creativity. So I have moments where I think, oh, I should get a real job and do my teaching. Then I, I win an award or I, I sell something in a, in a competition. And it makes me think, you know, this is why I do it. So those up and downs, there are months where I had I have minus 40 something dollars in my bank account at the moment. But uh, I just put six pieces into an exhibition. So hopefully in the next uh, Monday or Tuesday, I'll find out I have a few thousand dollars in the bank account. But, you know, this is that up and down thing. You've got to keep going for it. You know? Can I make a, a quick inserting comment? Yeah. Can anyone in the room diagnose what the problem is? Can anyone tell me what the problem is? I, I, I know the problem, but can you tell me what the problem is? Creative sustainability. Say again? Creative sustainability. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm searching for a clear definition of what the problem is. I, I'll give it to you in a moment, but first you must work for it. <laughs> if, I, if I just give it to you, you won't really appreciate it. I've got to get you to search for it. What do you think is the real cause of the problem? I'm going to put my hand up. Is it because Jamie's making a distinction between his creative life and his economic life? Potentially? That's a contribution towards where we're going. Okay. But I, I want to give you a diagnostic definition, specification of exactly what the problem is. Because once you've got diagnosis, you can develop strategy. If you don't have diagnosis, you work hard, you bump around the room, the lights are off, you're blind, you keep hitting the wall, you don't know where you're going. So we need to turn the light on by giving you a clear diagnostic specification, insight into exactly what the problem is. So can anyone help me? Is it this, is it this idea that maybe I'll get a real job? No, that's, okay. that's, take, that's taking us off the game. Okay, so... Because the game we want to play, I'm putting words in Jamie's mouth here, the game we want to play is we want to be a creative artist producing good quality work that is satisfying to produce for which the public will pay. Am I correct? No. Not no, once. You don't want to be paid up for the money at all. I've never once done it for the money. Not once. I just say you want to do it for the money, but you want to be paid. No, I mean, that's How a bonus. The reason I make is because it makes me smile, because okay. it keeps me sane. Because if, if I'm not making, I go nuts. If you don't get paid, how do you do it? I believe teach. Okay. Or so, I work at the video store. Or, so is it or I would take myself down that? to managing an income somewhere that helps if, balance that if, art making. If you were committed fully to your profession as an artist, yeah. they would have to find a way of making some money. And that's where I'm going with my conversation. Yeah, okay. And that's what I'm looking for by way of that diagnostic insight. Can anyone help me? That's a contribution to where we're going. You're, you're heading in the right direction. Are you saying managing money strategy? Aha! What kind of strategy? A, a, okay, the, the, the benefit of the strategy expressed financially, but it's a marketing and sales strategy. Here endeth my comment. It's a marketing and sales strategy. Every business I come across that is failing fails for one simple reason, lack of profitable sales. And every business I come across that's doing well is doing well because of profitable sales. And all profitable sales are a function of an effective marketing strategy. Can I, can I throw a little spanner in the works? Sure. In that in, sometimes we, in the arts industry, income doesn't necessarily come through sales, but through grants and scholarships and applications that aren't necessarily based on I mean, I suppose applying for a grant is part of your marketing strategy. That's it's a marketing role, but the pursuit isn't necessarily always a commercial imperative. Sometimes it's, it's a, and an imperative to meet a brief or to sort of fulfil some kind of other potentially a kind of critical obligation or something like that. It doesn't I suppose there's, there's transferable things there, but there's more. There's a lot of different 
income streams from the arts that don't necessarily result from selling. I recognise that, and grantsmanship itself is a discipline. Competing for grants is demanding. It takes time to compete for demand for, for grants, which takes you off your art. And you're relying upon the largesse of a government that may or not, may not be running deficits and may or may not be giving money away for grants. So that's somewhat tenuous. I guess as well, you're looking at, and this is for small, making your art a small business, and I've always seen my art as being what I do. The small business is the, the bonus, I guess. You know, like I don't make art to make the money. I've never once tried to make something to make the money and... And I guess I, I see success as not being the income for me, but as being where my name is, I guess, put, you know, like I've, I've been very lucky in my young art career to have the State Gallery WA owns two of my pieces in their collection. Uh, the National Glass Collection owns one. I just got the Wanneroo Art Prize. You know, these things that happen, they don't happen all the time, but when they do, that's what makes you go, this is why I'm doing it. But I also understand that there are people here that today are going to be looking at it as a business and so turning it into a business. Can we, let's take it back to the call. Let's go, um, yeah, let's go back to the call. Let's talk about why we get into the arts industry to start off with. Um, and, I, and for this point, I think we'll focus on you three, if that's okay, and feel free to jump in if anything happens. Um, where, did you, where did you start? Did you get into the industry thinking that you were going to make a – well, obviously you've kind of already answered that. It wasn't going to be a financial thing. No, not for me. I did it because that's what I loved. I couldn't possibly imagine – um, doing anything else outside the arts mm -hmm. and for me I'm not an artist I'm a curator and art history is really where I wanted to go so for me that was really not an option in some ways um, you know I'm interested in other things but it, at the end of the day it wasn't an option and I didn't really know where that was going to take me I didn't have a plan or a progression of my career mm -hmm where I wanted to end up eventually, um, you know, and it's very difficult as an emerging curator. You um, do a lot of volunteer work, you do a lot of internships, you do a lot of things that aren't paid at all and you sometimes have to have two jobs, um, you know, as well as your study. So you really have to balance those things. You also need to know when to say yes and no to mm -hmm. projects and I think that's really important and perhaps we'll, you know, touch on that a bit later on. But no, absolutely not. For me, it was something that I, um, you know, when someone says to me, I can't wait to retire, I just think I never want to retire. <laughs> and I think that's a really good kind of indication that you're in the right industry, that you never want to retire from what you do. Um, but, you know, it wasn't a very conscious decision for me and I never once thought about the money, um, you know, and had endless conversations with my parents about, you know, how is this going to work? And I didn't know, and that still didn't stop me. Mm -hmm. you know, if you want to add well, something? that's, I mean, that is, it's, that story is remarkably similar to, to what I had sort of, sort of planned to, to kind of um, to say. I grew up in regional WA, so when I thought about getting into an arts industry, I wouldn't, I, I mean, I wouldn't have even known what that what that idea or what that industry was. I went to art school from university because I, from high school, because I wanted to, to do it. And then because, I mean, it necessitated this move, you know, to 300 kilometers north away from my parents. It was a big decision and one that I sort of really undertook without necessarily in the same, in, in the same way having a plan or having a strategy or even knowing what uh, a profession might, might look like. And then, I mean, for me, I guess there's two different there's, there's two different points of entry into the arts industry because after university is sort of when I started becoming interested in curating as a practice simply because I started organising exhibitions with a group of people that I found that shared the same sort of ethos and shared the same interests as, as, as I had. And, I mean, for me, it's right. This is, I've only, I, I'm, I've been working in the industry for about 10 years and it's only just now that I am able to make a living uh, a natural living from, from what I do, which I sort of think about as a kind of small miracle every, every day. I've worked as a sort of a sexual academic, I've worked as a gallery attendant, I've worked in the cinema, I've worked as a barista, I've done a lot of things that aren't about my about my career. But at the same time I always had that second stream and that second thing that I was what I was doing. Which you can either look at as sort of a, a kind of uh, you know, a kind of passion or a sort of a, a, a way of being exploited, which you can be in a lot of cases. So it is about sort of... Could we could we arts. agree, though, that I, 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 I'm an artist as well and a lot of time I've spent my... I developed a career as a kind of house manager and trying to still work within the industries that I lived in. But 
ideally, I would love to be able to be a playwright and a puppeteer and a performer and earn my entire living from just that. Um, but perhaps circumstances has pu have pushed us into finding work and money streams elsewhere just for the simple fact that we need to live and live the certain lifestyle that we want to live. Ideally, as I say, I would love to be able to generate enough from my arts practice that fulfills me creatively as well as fulfills my pocket. <laughs> um, could we agree on that, that perhaps it's, it's circumstance that pushes us into other industries or is it because we don't want to drain that passion? I think I'm an I'm a art teacher and a careers teacher and part of my, my careers program mm -hmm. is that, you know, you take your strengths at what you're good at. Most people have 11 different careers in their lifetime. No one just has one job from the day they were kids to the, you know, the day they die. Especially when now they're jobs that are probably going to exist in the future that don't exist now. It's, sort of, yeah. it's, a, very, it's a very difficult time mm -hmm. to commit to any kind of long-term career path. Well, no, 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 you're right. You're entirely right. And, you know, I, I remember thinking as a kid, you know, learning about jobs becoming redundant and thinking, you know, as if I'm going to be redundant in, in 2000 and whatever we're in now, and I finished in 2000. But, um, you know, since then I've, I've been a video store manager, a teacher and a glass blower. All three of those things, you know, become redundant in my lifetime if they aren't already. Glass blowing is an ancient technique that is, I mean, you know, and this is the thing too, I chose to be a glass blower. People don't buy glass as much as they buy paintings or photography or graffiti on the wall, you know. I do the things I do because there's that innate, I think we both of you too, that innate something in me that makes me just go, you know, I have moments where I'm I'm turning about my boss's piece. It's all very um, teamwork based stuff. You can't do anything by yourself when you're blowing glass. So my boss sells a piece for fifteen thousand dollars and I'm turning it on a pipe and you know it's heavy and it's hot and it's wobbling around and I got sweat in my eye and my arms cramping up and I'm thinking, God, if I drop this I'm gonna get killed and I'm just like, fuck I love this. I don't know. But that's that's the moment that I just go, this is why I'm doing it, because as hard as it is, as intense as it is, as much as I don't eat all the time. It makes me happy, and and the video store, and you know, the bar, or babysitting, or teaching kids is, is a great bonus. I enjoy that too. So why not make the things that you're good at part of what you do anyway? So there's a website on the internet at the moment where you, a website on the internet that's basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I heard it. We all heard it. But there's a website where you can type in your profession, and it will show you the percentage chance of that position becoming redundant in the next 50 years. Oh, wow. But interestingly, an artist has the lowest the, the lowest point or the lowest percentage of, of redundancy because in a way those kind of traditional techniques are true, but they're also kind of ageless and there's mm. always in mm. a desire for um, for making. And it's the one thing that can't necessarily be automated unless you mm -hmm. get into a dialogue about the, about the ready made and yada 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 industry. But it is <laughs> in terms of being an artist it's something that is i think special because for for those reasons mm -hmm. i think yeah and but see like both of you have gone you know you still make you still create and you work in an industry that is part of what you love and what you, you believe in and for me teaching kids and you know helping them become creative and passionate or believe in themselves is is a great paycheck to help me keep making my art and, you know, and again, and every now, uh, well, I'm a relief teacher, so yeah, I drop off my resume at schools and I get called in the morning, seven in the morning. Mm -hmm. If I don't get called, I, I go down to the studio and make glass. So it's kind of it's a bonus, you know. When I don't get called, I think, oh, cool, I'm going to, to the studio today. You know, mm -hmm. it's time to work on my stuff. Um, I, I think that as a as a glass artist too, in an industry where galleries are closing everywhere. I think it's kind of good for me to, to put work in competitions. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can Google West Australian competitions. I just put a piece into the Wallara Small Sculpture Prize in Sydney. Didn't get in, but that's okay. Like, you know, I, I, I'm going to keep entering other ones. There's the um, Kalgoorlie one was just on, I think, closed a couple of days ago. That's $15,000 for the first prize. So, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't think when I put my piece in the Warner Art Show that I'd win. I was walking around the exhibition thinking, God, what am I doing here? I'm so stupid. Like, these people are so much better than me. And, you know, oh, my God, I'm so stupid for doing this. And they went through all the sculpture awards, and I was like, oh, you know, stupid me. You know? And the winner's Jamie Wars, and I was like, are you serious? <laughs> like, you got, you're absolutely kidding, aren't you? And so I think, you know, half of it is to believe in yourself and to put your work out there and don't let the people around you sort of telling you that you should get a real job to get, don't get a real job, get something that's involved in what you love and get keep doing it because get a this is my 15th year as an artist. Like, and like you said, only the last six years has anything really happened for me. So I think this is something that we that we'll begin to look at as we get a little bit closer to this as well as 
do we, I mean, at the end of the day, as an artist, you do want to share your work with other people. Yeah, of course. And in a, in a, whether that's sharing it with a gallery, having a gallery purchase um, a piece, having um, a pro festival program a show, um, if, you know, you end up getting onto a record label or something, you want your work to be shared with other people. Um, whether that means that you create an arts business that doesn't actually generate an income and you generate your income from elsewhere, perhaps that's something we can discuss, and whether it's it's viable and possible to have a arts business that isn't successful in the, in the terms of a business industry, but is successful in terms of getting your work out there, and then you've got your vocation on the side. Um, I think that, what that implies I, is you must first have a definition of success. Yeah, okay, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. Let's I'll, define. I'll throw one up for you. Yeah, great. From a, yeah, from to, to do what you really love and get paid for it. Yeah. Or to do what you really love and be paid enough. Uh-huh. Accountant. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> what does enough mean? Uh huh. Well, that depends on you. To be able to get an extra turn. No, it depends on it depends on your life. So where I would go if I was looking at business, sales and marketing strategy important, but we then take it in our small business dealing with other small businesses is that we look at cash flow. So that is what are my costs of being in business? And this, of course, changes depending on the size of our business. For some of us, the costs are going to be very low. For some of us, the costs are going to be very high, depending on what we're doing. <clears throat> and we work, we take those costs and we work it down to what we want to make as far as the bottom line and add the two together to see what our sales are going to have to be. Does anyone know what bottom line means? The Does income, the income we want. And of course, this, this is uh, not something that I can determine for you. This would be something that you can only determine for yourselves because some of us need more money and some of us need less money. And if some of us are going to have more than one uh, job, then obviously it's going to be a, a moving target. But the cash flow is really important, as important as the, as the sales and marketing strategy. It's like making a list for a party or, or a, a planning your holiday. If you don't know what your costs are, you might fail. And this is where small business often fails. Don't know my costs, don't have enough cash. And then both of those spell disaster. And that's before we even get to the interesting part like keeping receipts. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did, knowing that, was there a point where you guys started to, to look at your cost flow? Have you, have you done that? Have you decided to split it so that you've got a vocation on the side and realise that you've got the the flow has got to come from elsewhere. Oh, I don't think I'm the best person to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, have you done? Was it? No. Rather than, no. I know. Have you thought seems, about, was there a point where you did? Like, see, glass blowing is such an odd thing, you know, like you, it depends on the art, the craft you make and, and, and what you're doing. So for me to have my own studio requires a good $50,000. Uh, gas and oxygen pumping 365 days a year. If if the pot the pot that costs itself a thousand dollars that holds one hundred and fifty kilos of glass, if that turns off, if the gas or the oxygen turns off for some reason during the night, the whole thing cracks and blows up a ten fifteen thousand dollar machine. You know, it's it's better for me to hire somewhere to go in there a day and make six to eight pieces, and then I'll spend the next I'll spend forty hours per piece. So it costs me about two and a half thousand dollars to make five roughly, and I sell one piece for two thousand two hundred. They don't sell every week. But again, like I make one in about a, a you know a week or so. When did that sales start? Did, was there a point where somebody came in and said, "I'd like to buy one," or you looked at it and said, "Hey, I could make some money from this," or why don't I try and cover some of my costs? Or uh, funnily enough, I think Big Fish Small Pond. Hey, I, I was in Sydney blowing glass, being an artist, trying to survive. Um, I actually I went to art school because it was the only thing I was good at in high school. I got ninety seven percent for art, I got thirty three percent for maths. So I obviously wasn't going to business or the accounting <laughs> side. I was going down the making side. Um, I, I had something happen to me in my early life and made me go, life's that short, just do it. You feel right and ride the wave, you know, like if you fall down, you can get back up again and try something different. It doesn't mean you have to stop and feel bad about yourself. You've learned something. Um, so I went to art school, did glass blowing. I actually managed to do ceramics. Um, was eating my like, lunch every day, watching the glass blowing, going, this is amazing. Someone said, well, why don't you do this? You're here every day. And I thought, I don't know how. You know, you're at uni, man. What do you think you're doing here? I said, oh, yeah, all right. So I went and changed last minute. To glass blowing, um, I did that for three years. Met a Swedish girl and went and blew glass in Sweden for a year. So I'd never been overseas before. 
figured what a great chance. Um, spent a year in Sweden working in a glass studio and also working behind a bar. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I was working from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. in a glass studio. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I was working from 8 p.m. till 4 a.m. in a bar. So absolute opposite ends of the day, first three days, next three days, and then trying to get back onto it on Sunday to get back to work on Monday. But I had the best year of my life by far, like the best year of my life. I came back and did my honours because I didn't know what else to do. You know, I still didn't really consider myself an artist. I was just doing what felt right. I uh, did my honours degree and met someone from Perth who was working with my two favourite glass artists. And he said, you know, you should come over here and check out Perth. So I came here with a bag of a bag of clothes and two hundred dollars, and I've been here for eight years. Uh, I didn't know how long I'd be here for. I came to work with my, my heroes of what I do, uh, and during that time, you know, these guys would have exhibitions on in the galleries that they were sort of exhibiting through and say, "When are we going to see some of your work?" And I was like, "Oh, do you want some?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, we want some." So I made four pieces, put it in an exhibition, and my first sale was to stay Gary WA. So I was like. I think I might be all right at this. I might, I might keep doing this. And um, yeah, thank yeah, thank you. But like, and also I look at that and think, oh my God, there's so much wrong with it. You know, you yeah. have to be able to learn to step back from your work and, and let go of it. And as artists, I think we all overanalyze the world. So you, know, so you had decided to enter that as a career. You decided no, to enter like, something that you needed to happy. do. And then so far it's kind of established yeah, itself yeah. as a career. Yeah, yeah. Like I never once, I did a talk at Sydney Uni. The uni I went to and did, did my art degree and I was doing a, an artist talk with the slides up and I said, I don't consider myself an artist. I said to Jess, I don't think I'm really the right person to be an artist to talk to you guys. And they're like, well, no, you're doing it, you're living it, you're doing the hard run, whatever. And, and I'm successful, I guess, because I keep fighting it. Like, you know, every day I think I can get a real job and I keep on putting pieces in and you get turned down sometimes. And well, and also, can I just put this out to the audience? How, how does that be if you're an artist? Hands up if you were full time solely an artist in that field. <laughs> I don't know anyone. I don't. Who's yeah, I don't. Full time artist. The people I work with, they all have other jobs. They all. Well, okay, one of them. Oh, I shouldn't even say this, but you know, it's it's one of them is still living in a situation where he probably doesn't want to be living. Someone else is not really making that much money from it. You know, it's it's they've all got other ways of having other avenues. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I work for artists. We have a lot of artists that do, yeah. they, they come from art, but they don't really make anything. So, but do you say they work in art source? Do they get income from art source? No, no. Oh, because it's a, a free thing. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And so they make all their income from their yeah. art alone. Yeah. Cool. So it's possible, and, yeah. and that's why we're here as well, because that's what ultimately we want. We want to be within our field, and we want to be able to generate yeah. that enough income to be able to yeah. continue making money. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
plan or you do make uh, more than $75,000 worth of gross income. So it's these little things. Uh, business names you need, and it's not free, of course, you have to buy it, if you plan to use a name other than your own name. So you might have a, a, a pseudonym that you, you might care to use, or uh, for marketing purposes, you might have a business name that you'd really like to adopt. And of course, it costs. And you've got to pay year after year for the use of that. So I think that these are these are very real um, issues that you need to address. But that initial budget, for me, is the most important. And then everything else follows on from there. The insurance and all of that. I think yeah, um, what's also important to think about is the I think so something I touched on before is is to be aware and to be realistic and also sort of um, kind of aware of the the different kinds of income streams that you can have and the different ways that artists can make money from art. So I mentioned grants. I mentioned there's art, artist, artist um, prizes, so community prizes and um, community art awards, and then on a kind of the on a larger scale competitions, commissions, public artworks. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that, I'm, and I'm, I'm also speaking about visual art because that's, sort of, that's my background, but there's also uh, a lot of different kinds of ways that you can generate, not, ne not necessarily an income, but funding for your for your practice. And keeping art sources are great, is, is a great one to kind of to be mindful of because art source also has great insurance. Mm. So be aware of your advocacy bodies, be aware of the, the, the places the DCA, the, the federal government, the kind of structures that exist out there that will allow you to to kind of to compete and to to participate in that. So it isn't necessarily all about making work for a commercial market. That might not not necessarily be what you're interested in because there is a lot of art. I'm thinking about sort of performance art, conceptual art, art that doesn't necessarily have a saleable outcome. So that might that might, and that for you might be a part of a stream of inquiry. So you might be able to have work that do make an income, but you can also look at other ways of generating things. It's just it's really important to be sort of aware of what's out there and and what you can do and the requirements for a, sort of applying and accessing that funding. I would say as well, because it's also it's not just about making <clears throat> practice sustainable. It's making a career as an artist. So those. Those two things for me are parallel. Yeah, D two different it's not a factory, things that no, are it? that are parallel. So you might, as an artist, be working towards you know a number of exhibitions in an artist-run space where you don't sell any work. So you might be looking for grants in order to fund that project. And there's also artist fees for those things. So you know you can spend that money on your food as well in some instances. So as Gemma said, it. it you know, there are different streams and that's also very important. So for me, from my point of view, you also have to have a plan and know what you want to do in any particular year. So have two artist run um, initiative shows, for example, and maybe sell three works. So that might be completely different ways of approaching your practice and marketing it. I'm, I'm going to say that because, you know, it's... it's <laughs> What I oh, sorry, no. Yeah, no. What I found when when we ran the gallery, so OK Gallery was a, sort of an interesting space that it was it was an artist run initiative that kind of ran on a commercial model. So we didn't take proposals, we programmed internally, and we but we were aiming to, to sell work. We got a couple of but we were Jake's work actually in the ceramics cabinet that yeah. that came from us at Agua, which I'm really proud of. Um, but what I found, oh, okay. Uh, what, what I what I found was that when artists would approach OK Gallery, and also when artists approach me as sort of at at work um, at UWA, is that what I find is that a lot of people haven't really read the industry and understand and understood the difference in galleries and the different kinds of um, roles and responsibilities those galleries and those venues have within within an industry. So it's and that's what you're saying in terms of having a career. It's important to be able to read. The industry, so knowing knowing what an artist run initiative does, knowing what a commercial gallery does, knowing what a state gallery does, and understanding the different kind of, kinds of imperatives that those gallery ha that galleries have, so you can determine what is the right sort of pathway to success for you. Because they all, they don't all have the same the same kind of mission statements, and they don't they won't kind of bring you the same the same rewards necessarily. Yeah. That's I think 
And it's something that I, I find that artists tend to overlook is that a gallery isn't necessarily a gallery. A gallery is a very specific gallery. And it's also very easy to find out about those galleries and the, acquisi the acquisition pol policies and annual reports of most sort of state margin galleries will be online. There's a lot of information that you can kind of, it's just sort of about in a way doing your research, which will benefit you as much as as it well, while we're on that, and I do want to skip over and jump over to the business side of it as well, but while we're on that in, in approaching galleries and approaching um, different organisations, from your point of view, what are the tips and tricks? Have you had some really horrible examples of how people have approached you yeah, and yeah, what absolutely. should we remember not to do? Don't contact a curator on Facebook and try and sell your work to <laughs> do, not do, do not do that. Do not do that. That's a bad move. Don't write you know, 10,000 words about what you like and who you're influenced by if you're approaching a curator or a gallery. Um, and I also worked in commercial galleries, so that, you know, we, we can talk about that. But you also need to be very concise and very specific and <coughs> professional. So, you know, when you send someone your resume, just make sure it's well edited, that it's, you know, presentable, that that person can show it to their boss, to someone else. You know, because you're also networking in a way. If you're proposing an exhibition, then you also need to know what you're proposing and why, you know, not just that it's your work and you'd like it to be shown. You know, there's there's also guidelines as to, you know, a lot of galleries would have um, proposal guidelines and you have to follow those. You absolutely have to read those carefully. And if a gallery as, doesn't have pro pro proposal guidelines, it probably means they don't take proposals. So yeah. you need to access that gallery in, in a different, a That's different right. way. And then you call, you approach them, you ask them, and you start that conversation. Um, but, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've received, um, you know, emails detailing, um, you know, an artist's practice and why they would love to have their work in our gallery. Um, and that's just not the way that you do it. You don't do that with collections. You know, um, it's that is done in a different way. And that's really important that, you know, you need to know how to approach different galleries. And if you're not sure, then just call a curator, call someone, go to speak openings. to the, go to openings, you know, yeah. um, front desk, start those conversations because that's going to be really invaluable. In a commercial gallery, it's, it's you know it kind of works slightly differently, but sounds like a marketing strategy. It does. Well, that, mm. that was what there I was going yeah. to jump in with because it's it's also important to. I mean, it's like a job application. You don't necessarily mm. say what why that gallery is right for you. You say why you're right for the gallery. You do your research and you make your pictures specific. Yeah, if that's if that's how you're if that's how you're doing it, you need to have you need to know. You need to sort of demonstrate that you understand how that gallery works and why it would be the right circumstance for you to work for you, for you to work with that gallery. Generally, broad, like a general broadcast is generally never never that successful. And I mean, even specific broadcasts are, are often aren't. But if you can tell from an, an an email that the artist hasn't sort of actually engaged with the the venue that you work in, or with its sort of philosophies, with its acquisition proposal with any of its kind of they it sort of says in a way that they haven't been through the door and they don't know they don't know what they want and that's sort of an immediate red flag in terms of that that artist sort of the, the, the fit that that'll that that'll be <clears throat> sorry can we talk about planning this strategy sure. um, and and how and how we begin that um, is it a, yeah yeah uh, yeah okay <laughs> statement, first of all my wife is an amateur artist she trained as a psychologist, she graduated doing social work, she's worked with abused children, but her love is art. And I have some sympathy for the art-minded person. She finds me strange. I read books on cats, which I think is really interesting, and she thinks it's really boring. <laughs> Jeff would think it's interesting, she thinks it's boring. So the point I'm making here is there's a mindset, which I mentioned to you earlier, and there's a mindset for business, and there's a mindset for art. So in terms of where do you start, if the question is where do you start, I'm going to give you some guiding principles and I'll try and slow down so you can make notes because I'm going to give you some pure gold. You ready? You're going to say yes or no, you ready? Yes. yes. <laughs> first step, first step, decide how much you need to make for you. Decide how much you need to make for you per annum. 
I'll pluck a figure out of the sky. You need about 25 million a year. Now, you can scientifically assess that by going back and looking at your tax returns the last couple of years. And you work out from your tax return how much you received by way of take home pay. You look at your bank account to see how much you saved, nothing. You now know how much your annual cost of living is. So scientifically, you measure how much your annual cost of living is and how much of that has to come from your own. First step. Second step. Whatever you need to make from your art, let's use the figure of 25,000 for the sake of tonight's conversation. Triple it. 25,000 tripled is 75,000, which triggers the GST paradoxically. And by the way, about some of the comments Jeff made, go and buy professional advice if you're starting a business. Go and buy professional advice if you're starting a business. By the way, go and buy professional advice before you start a business. And please don't start a business without going and buying professional advice. And did I mention go and buy professional advice? Because all the time I'm dealing with people that didn't and they're now in severe, severe difficulties. It could have been prevented. They could have been vaccinated against the business risks that they face. Back to the matter, the guiding principle. So now we've got a t income target, 75 grand a year. Agree? Now, here's what I would do, and keep in mind I'm not an artist bootlace, and I take my hat off to each of you for the creativity you have, but I wish I had and I don't have. If I was faced with the following challenge, if Jeff came to me and said, Brian, all your income streams are drying up, and the sole way you can make a living from now on is by putting your wife to work, and you've got to get her to produce $75,000 a year to bring $25,000 a year to the bottom line so you can stay alive, here's what I'd do. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. I would find 100 people in Australia who are full-time self-employed artists, full-time in art, nothing else but art, in business, making money. I'd find 100 in Australia and New Zealand. And I'd tell myself they existed. For if I tell myself they don't exist, I won't find them. And if I tell myself they do exist, I will find them. And I would find 100 artists who are making a sustainable income out of their art business. And I'd make contact with each one of them by telephone. And here's what I would say. I'm located in Perth. I'm not going to come and compete with you in Newcastle, Sydney, Melbourne, or wherever you are. But I wish to go into doing an artistic business, and I wonder if I could have a chat to you for a few minutes. And I build a telephone relationship with each of those people. And what you would find is that in each state, there'd be five or 10 with whom I had a meeting of the mind. There would be a commonality between us. We would enjoy the conversation. We'd say, wouldn't it be lovely if we could catch up for a coffee? You've got one minute. I would then go for a study tour across Australia. Don't ask me how you're going to fund this. I'm just, <laughs> <in my> <laughs> I'm just about to. Okay. I'd go on a study tour across Australia and I'd visit each of those people in their hometown. I'd walk down the street and look at their studio from the outside and assess the streetscape, assess the other people around them, the other businesses around them, whether they're opposite a bus stop or a train station or some such. I'd go into their business and I'd see them and I'd spend the day with them. I'd take them out night, that night for dinner. I'd buy them all the wine they could possibly drink while I drank sparkling water. And let them talk. Because what I want to know is how do I get from where I am to where you are? How did you do it? And I'd ask each of these 100 people for guiding principles. And I'd come back to Western Australia with at least five or six people with whom I had a close bond. And I'd treat each of them as my mentors. And I'd be in touch with them on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, telling them how I'm going, telling them where I'm going, and ask them for insights and guidance on how to get there. Because here's what you've got to understand about business. There is no such thing as a self-made entrepreneur. There is no such thing as a self-made businessman. There is no such thing as a self-made millionaire. It's media <coughs> rubbish. The truth of the matter is everyone had mentors. Everyone had mentors. Everyone had mentors. No one got to where they are without someone else giving them a helping hand. So the message I'm giving you is bring that systematically into your mind. Go and find people who are successful doing what it is you'd like to do, commercial practice and ask them for assistance and support and telephone guidance. And you'll find that if you go about the right way, you can build a bank of mentors who can give you answers to your problems. Because here's what you've got to remember. For every problem you face between now and the day you die, for every problem you face between now and the day you die, someone else has had that problem, someone else has solved that solution, that problem, 
that solution is sitting on a shelf somewhere waiting for you to pick it off, and you don't even have to pay for it. Find mentors. That's my message. Right. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. And I'm lucky because even again in the glass industry, you can't do it by yourself. So I've worked in Sweden and, and Canberra and mm. Melbourne and Sydney and Perth, working with my mentors who I do ask information and do take notes. And whether I write it in a plan and, and I'm as sort of, you know, know my figures and whatever, I, there's always something in my head about the yearly plan and where I want to be at the end of the year and what I have hopes for. And, you know, and I do, you know, put in as many pieces as you can and, and find people who you agree with because. I mean, you might not have the time for the hundred, but pick ten that you love, that you look up to, and maybe five of them you're going to get along with, and five you're going to realise do things very different because we all do things so differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I say to the kids every day, there's there's not a single person on this planet that's anything like you. You're the only one that's lived this life, that's lived your life, that makes you understand the things that you understand. The way you see the world is there's no one else that sees it anything like you. And I think instead of comparing your life to other people and trying to figure out how to be, Try to be comfortable with who you are and what I think you need to be. And those walls that you come across, there's always a way over that wall, around that wall, or under that wall. And, and you know, uh, Brian's right. You can find someone that will get you there. You've just got to find the right person that knows how to code to get under or around it. Yeah. Or if you can't, hire someone that can. You know, as, as, as a glass artist, I don't do metal fabricating. and sometimes I need metal parts made. So I go find a metal fabricator that can do something for me. I'm not gonna, I don't have the time to learn how to do that. It's still my work. It's still my creation. It's still my art, you know? I think I went from ceramics that's so personal to suddenly making things with someone else and going, but it's not mine anymore. I didn't, I didn't make it. Someone else, you know, sort of touched it and did it. And you know, an architect designs a house. It's still his his piece of work. He didn't build the bricks. He didn't lay the wood. You know, it's still his design or her design. It's probably reinforced the mental message I gave you. I'm probably the oldest person in the room, and I've been doing my craft, my profession, my love. For 34 years and I have a mentor and my mentor has a mentor and that mentor has a mentor who's me there's actually three of us we run between us so whenever I've got a problem I've got two choices I can work hard at trying to solve the problem or I can ask my mentor if he's had this problem before and nine, nine times out of ten he has and while I'm talking about it my email goes off bing because he's just sent through the solution that he's been talking about now, if he can't solve it, he goes to his mentor, she, if she can't solve it, she comes to me. But by the time it's gone through him to her to me, it's changed shape. I've had more time to play with it, and Jenny, we can nut it out. I could not do what I do on my own. I am smart enough to know how dumb I am. And I go and get people who are smarter than me to help me become as smart as they are. That's the message I want you to take. Building on that, oh, this is where I want to draw you back to the earlier comment as well. If you're sitting in a room of other artists that are facing the same problems, have faced those same problems, that can be that mentor, that can be that collaborating force. And especially in Perth as well, the power of asking somebody for a cup of coffee, taking them out for a cup of coffee. Arts organisations with Perth, in within Perth, are very willing to do that, and this industry is very open and will have that coffee with you and will have that conversation if you're brave enough to ask for it. Um, before we open it up, I just want to touch on, um, in the recent federal budget, oh, yes. <laughs> so you've, got, you've got your business, you've got your business here there, let's say we've got it there, um, and let's talk about what now, what we're facing right now in 2015, um, in regards to the federal budget and the latest small business cuts. Well, the, uh, the main one is the incentive, of course, the $20,000, up to $20,000 of tax deduction for new plant and equipment, which is useful if you've got any money to spend on plant and equipment. And of course, you've got to be in business, whatever that means to you, you've got to be in business, you've got to be turning a dollar, in other words, in order to be able to get the benefit. That is, it's a tax deduction, it's not a rebate. So that, what it means in short is, if I've sold $20,000 worth of art, I can deduct the $20,000 item or collection of items up to $20,000 each and deduct it against that to bring my taxable income down to something lower. And if I've earned $20,000 and I've got $20,000 deductions, I would have taxable income of nothing. And so it's a useful thing for those of us that are already in business 
it's an incentive, of course, which is what government wanted to spend money in the community. And if any of us are uh, are already generating income, then this is a great thing. But does it have to be twenty thousand? Could it be if it was a five thousand? Does it? It can be anything up to twenty thousand. Up to sixty dollars. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So anything yeah. you buy for your business That's up to twenty grand. Yeah, up to twenty thousand dollars. Uh, prize money worth. Yeah, but it's. It, it, it's yeah, important to take advantage of because very yeah. few grant or grants of that's your living will make you will let you invest in capital goods. Mm. So it's a pretty good. It's a pretty good. Yeah, mm. but only if you you don't only spend the money if you need the item that you're buying. That is the other thing. <laughs> Otherwise, that's well, well, it's 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 false, it's isn't it? If you have to, to, to buy to something, business. yeah, you wouldn't buy a table if you didn't need the table um, for the business, of course. Yeah, the business table. Yeah. Uh, all the business <laughs> Uh, you can buy well. You can buy a car for business. Uh, there's other rules associated there. Yeah. No, and this. I'll take it a step further. The car. You wouldn't get both. Okay. It's one or the other. And the car would have to be less than twenty thousand dollars, up to twenty thousand dollars, because you. Can, it's not a discount. <laughs> it's a deduction for assets up to twenty thousand dollars. So, if you're a photographer, you could buy yourself your new photography equipment. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but you couldn't buy a forty thousand dollar car and then deduct for twenty thousand dollars. And, and how long is that available for? Obviously. This is uh, to uh, the thirtieth of June, two thousand and seventeen. Mm -hmm. What? So, there's a way to run. <laughs> I thought it was just till the tax one just went. Well, it's spent up. It's, the, it's it's enshrined in legislation now, so we've got it. And that's from Budget Night, which was the 12th of May. So, um, <clears throat> my unsolicited recommendation is if you're thinking about taking advantage of this, get advice. Did I mention getting advice? <laughs> <laughs> it just so happens we've got two people that you could get some advice on. And, yeah. and the reason I constantly felt that is because I come across people that are losing their house because they didn't get advice. And when they lose the house, they usually lose the marriage. And when they lose the marriage, they usually lose the system. Their whole world collapses. And it goes back to the lack of getting proper advice at the outset. There's one more interesting part of the budget. The budget didn't have much in it, incidentally, <laughs> if, you, if you read it. Yeah. Um, there's it probably doesn't apply to anyone in the room. There's a the company tax rate is down to 28.5%. Which is um, useful if you've got a company. If you're a sole trader or some other entity like a trust, there's a maximum one thousand dollar tax benefit for you. So if, again, if you're generating income and you have tax to pay, there is a one thousand dollar benefit. Uh, again, through to um, well, it's in the in the current year anyway. One thousand dollars in this current year benefit to you if you have taxable income uh, and you're in business. So that would not come off other earnings. It's off your business earnings. And it's part and it could be part thereof. That is, uh, if if it's if your business doesn't generate enough to give rise to a thousand dollar rebate, you'll only get part of the rebate. How this works in print in, in practicality we haven't seen yet, but no doubt that will fall out the bottom. Politicians normally dream these things up and then someone behind the scenes is busy writing all of the rules. Which normally ends in disaster and, comple <laughs> and complexity, which is why you need advice. I think it's also important, if I may, just jump in here. I um, I did a lot of independent projects as well as working two jobs and as well as being a student. And my mother is a bookkeeper and couldn't really help me with my tax return. And she said you should probably go to an accountant. At which point I thought, well, what's the point of having you around? <laughs> <laughs> But I followed her advice anyway, and it was the best advice because the accountant knew exactly what was happening that year, any changes that I needed. So I was, you know, putting some of my own money into shows that I was curating while also getting some money on the side and from galleries and other sources of funding. So my accountant was able to sit down with me and work it out. And say to me, okay, if you're going to do this again, keep those receipts. This you definitely can't claim, so don't worry about that. But this is what we're working towards. And next year, buy a new computer. 
you know, I didn't even think about those things. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even something that I just yeah. didn't, I couldn't afford a computer. But, you know, that was the best advice because that kind of fed back into that loop of running, uh, you know, running I my own small The important thing sort of there as well is to make sure you're seeing the right tax agent as well. That uh, My last tax agent in the middle of my tax return from two years ago, because I haven't done it for a little while, um, <laughs> in the middle of it, she said, yeah, but you're not a performer. What do you mean? And my whole <gasps> income from my, from my ABN was from performance and creating. And she said, yeah, but you do stage management. And I had this moment of going, you don't know what I do. You're my tax agent and you don't know my business. And I said, do you have any other artists on your books? And she mm. didn't have one. And I think that's one of the important things as well. And this is why one of the reasons why we spoke to our, our union, our, um, the Alliance as well, and, and found, asked to find someone that specialised within the arts or at least had other artists on their books. And, you know, we're, we're very grateful to have found someone who's here with us tonight. And you can Thank also you. claim the, uh, the accounts. Yeah. 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 Uh, can I just, just on that receipts issue, uh, is um, the best thing you can do is... There's a business card in one of those green or black bags with our website on it. And um, if you're really bad at keeping receipts, because my advice is to keep every receipt possible, because if you don't keep them, then you haven't got them to argue with when you meet the accountant. Um, because you won't know what's deductible and what's not. So if you keep everything, you're fine. But if you use our, on our if you look on our business card, it is our website, and you can download an app free app for your phone so that you can photograph your receipts because you probably, if you're starting out in business, you probably won't have any way of putting things in the water. In the old days, we used to put them to lever arch files, didn't we, and put them shoe in boxes. order. To, or shoe boxes. <laughs> but um, using your smartphone is better and the app will enable you to order them and summarise them and categorise them and all the other things. But you know, that's just an option and it's free. Um, failing that, you'd need some other methodology, plastic sleeve, envelope, lever arch. But I do encourage you to keep every receipt possible. Argue about them later because if you don't keep them, they're gone. So, I've noticed some of my receipts after a year or so, you pull them out and they've all faded. Yeah. That's why you've got to use the app. Well, no, it's, yeah, that's what. So I, I write on them. Now in pen, and I put them yeah. in a lever arch folder. You can do but that. If you take a photo, is that is that still a legal document? Or it's legal to annotate them, so you're allowed to. And those ones that fade, those yeah. light sensitive ones, you can annotate. That's lawful, but you can't alter it. And obviously, if it all fades off, it's a bit of paper and you've annotated. It means nothing. So if you've written there with pen and it's all faded, it means nothing. If we can't read the other bits, it means nothing. Uh, I'm going to start taking Better to notes. take them. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be with our app. You can take I'm a sorry. photo on your yeah. on your phone anyway. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more Take the photos more. Cool. Would you like to know how to find a good accountant? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You can't do this like me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking for one. <laughs> okay. The first thing you do is you get a list of at least three or four accountants' names recommended to you from people who are successful in art or in the industry you want to get into. So you go to people who are successful and ask them for the name of their accountant. And you need at least three or four. Once you've got those three or four names, you ring the firm and you ask to speak to a partner. And you ask the partner for an introductory meeting where you want to sit with them and talk to them about your potential position as a potential client. The partner will give you that time and they won't charge you for it. The purpose of the meeting is very simple. The singular purpose of the meeting is to see whether there's a meeting of the minds between you and the accountant, whether they communicate with you at a level that you're comfortable and appear to demonstrate some understanding of you and, and the particular business you want to set up. I recommend you interview at least three accountants. And you need to take a, a set of questions with you and ask the same questions of each of the accountants. And I can tell you what the questions should be in a moment. But remember the purpose is to understand whether there's a personality fit and a meeting of the minds. I also suggest if you're a female, you take a male with you. If you're a male, you take a female with you. If you're a male, listen carefully. She will see things that you didn't see and she will hear things you didn't hear that were said at the meeting that you're convinced weren't said when you were at the meeting. <laughs> She'll pick up on stuff you didn't pick up on. Girls, the guys will see things that you didn't necessarily pick up on first one. It, there's an advantage in taking them out of the opposite sex with you. So here are the questions you should ask the accountant. Are you ready? Yes. 
Okay, the first question, why did you choose accounting at uni? Shall we, shall we try it? <laughs> How much business do you want to get here, man? You can ask Mark. Mark, why did, yeah, yeah. what was the first question? Why did you choose business at accounting at university? Why did I choose it? Because mm. um, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> better answer than sure money. Yeah, I could do it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's like anything. You have aptitude. You feel the aptitude to it, yeah. You follow that. That's good, sir. And that's what you're looking for. Someone's got the aptitude for the particular discipline you're studying. Yeah. Second question. What was the best subject? What was the best subject? At university? Is that... What was your best subject? In yeah. moments. Okay. It doesn't matter what the answer is. You're building a relationship. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you want to hope he doesn't Ask. say ask. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the point I want to take away, the takeaway on this is... The answer is irrelevant. You simply have a vehicle to establish a relationship. That's what you're there for. Third question. You ready for it? Yeah. What was your worst subject? No. Oh, Think much. carefully. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, was your, what was your worst subject? Fourth question. What did you do? <laughs> 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 what was your worst subject? Yeah, what was your subject? was English. Ah, there you go. Because he's from New Zealand. That's like potential client. Does it matter his worst subject was English? No. What matters is we're getting a sense of feeling with this person, we're getting a sense of connection. And then we ask them what they did about it. Can I add one thing to all of this, which is terribly important? Some accountants won't give you a free trial. Of course. Other accountants will. Fortunately, we're one of those accountants. <laughs> uh, the, uh, some of you have got account reports, and I think on the back of it, it does say you get the first 15 minutes, is it? Or 30 minutes? I don't know. Anyway, we always say to people, because we can smell trouble at 50 paces anyway, so it's going both ways. Um, funny what you pick up in three minutes after so many years. Um, but yeah, when you do ring to make that time to go in, do insist on um, the scenario of I'm coming in to, to interview you. Is it for free? Uh, we do it with people because we say, if you don't like us in 15 minutes, you're welcome to go. And I think that's fair because it's got to be a good fit and you've got to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, or you'll and, end up with someone who doesn't know what your job is. Yeah, and you can normally <laughs> tell in 15 minutes yeah. what, uh, you know, whether you like someone. Speaking of ten minutes, we've got more time than that. But let's are we ready? <laughs> let's open it up. Okay. Who's got some questions? Woo! In regards to keeping receipts, mm -hmm. does your bank statement count if all your transactions? Are well, uh, look, credit card statements, bank statements. These are obviously supporting documents. The law is the. Um, especially with GST, the law is fairly specific. You do need, you do need tax invoices. Um, and so from a, if, you're, if you're in the GST environment, that is your turnover is more than 75,000, that's gross sales, uh, you would be expected on balance to have most of your tax invoices. And that's why photo, photographing them or filing them is so important. From an income tax perspective, which is a different set of legislation, the tax office would be less likely to be bothered about tax invoices per se. They're happy with other forms of evidence. Um, but I would always try and keep the tax invoices or something like that, the source documents. Um, naturally, it's recurring entries like bank fees. If you're being charged $10 every month um, or insurance, you're being charged insurance every month or Telephone, you're being charged that every month. Probably less likely that they would demand a tax invoice. But certainly on the one offs, I think that it's something you do need to focus on. So if we I, haven't been, yeah, yeah, if we haven't been doing that and we've been relying on our bank mm -hmm. statements, you know, if we happen to be that person, <laughs> um, <laughs> screwed. Well, uh, screwed. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reality, I think, the reality of 
the tax office, treasury tax office, those people, the people that manage uh, the tax system, is that they are in fact screwed. They don't have enough staff. They certainly don't have the budget. And therefore, the likelihood of scrutiny is uh, diminishing. That doesn't mean that we're safe because the audit technique has changed from coming in and uh, putting the spotlight on your face to ringing people like us and asking for us to uh, email through, scan an email through evidence. This is why that so software on the telephone is really handy because you've got it there. So I think audits, the traditional audit is getting less likely, especially at small, the small end of town. That is for most of us, less likely, but not impossible. This year, the tax office have promised to audit telephone, internet, motor vehicle, and rental properties. Probably less, less um, likely to affect us in the room here, but certainly with internet, telephone, there's there's a problem and they're threatening but whether they follow through is another uh, another story so to get back to the question are we screwed probably not but i would always try and maintain most of my my receipts or have supporting documentation um, and if you can't get it then record it in a diary that's what i've always thought of on our website we have um, uh, free stuff you can download there's diaries there to keep track of home office time, electricity. Mm -hmm. There's a diary in there, the same diary you can use for computer use, because that might be part business, part private. Um, certainly your internet usage, you can record on the same thing. We've got a motor vehicle logbook on there to record your kilometers, because kilometers can be deductible in certain circumstances. And that's available online. On our website, under our forms directory, you just download it. But what I would also encourage you to do, whether you use us or not, not important, we're here tonight um, to support, obviously, um, Propel. But uh, I would like to be able to say, or I'll say it, uh, I'll say that um, for any of you, if you're concerned about record keeping and you're not sure, drop me an email, okay? I'm not going to invest hours in it, I'll be honest, but drop me an email and ask me the question. You've got my business card. Uh, you've, you'll know my website because it's on that business card or just search for me. And if you're worried, ask the question. Failing that, ask, ask the accountant that you know already or one of the three that you find. Uh, because if you don't ask, you don't get. And if you don't get, you might not uh, make a successful claim and you might miss out and that's the worst thing because then the treasury wins. And the tax law always errs on the side of treasury and government, always. It's not about us, it's about them. So you've got to keep those records. And you've got to start keeping your records. <laughs> yes, and otherwise yes, you miss do. out. And that's, it introduces <laughs> risk and we don't want risk. Yes. Mm. Talking about asking questions, yes. Um, I have a couple of times. Knock me out. <laughs> Give me a first shot. Okay, no, firstly, I really wanted to know about your mentor. If you might share that with us, who that might be and how you met them. And secondly, I wanted to ask you mentioned the marketing strategy, and I think you tell me the pipeline within the art industry at the moment is that marketing strategy and sort of getting um, our voice out, for example. Is there any ideas? I could talk about three days without taking a breath on marketing, so I'll try and But to your question about my mentor, he is a business advisor. I'm a business advisor. Uh, I went around uh, Western Australia doing presentations and workshops in rural areas. Uh, I did, for example, understanding of financials or business plan. I'd, I'd come into town to do a workshop for the local Chamber of Commerce or someone like that, and people would say, oh, do you know Fred Blocks? He was here three months ago. He did such and such. And he was also doing the same thing. He was going to rural areas and they're saying, oh, did you, did you know Brian Charles? He was here six months ago. So we kept missing each other for about six or seven years. And one day a common contact introduced us to each other and we both just looked at each other and exploded with laughter because we've been hearing about each other for years and years. He had gone down a number of tracks I wanted to go down. I'd gone down a number of tracks he wanted to go down. So we did the, I'll show you mine, you show me yours. And that's how we started out. But then we also got to the point where we ran into deadlocks. So he and I were both at a roadblock. 
Now there was a third person who came to us and said, you know, would you like, would you guys like to set up a joint venture with us? We think you can bring something to the table. And, and I said no, he said no, but we said we'd like you to use, it, use you as a sound board. So between the three of us, we resolved what are the problems. But what I found was a peer who had been doing something similar, but not identical, and had found ways of making money using strategies I hadn't thought of, and wanted copies of strategies I had used to make money to show him and vice versa. And we've been uh, dealing with each other for about 12 years, and we have a very, very intimate and close friendship. Uh, sometimes we don't see each other for a month or two, but instantly if one of us rings the other, we take the call, we drop whatever else we're doing, we drive in, and, and the conversations are short to the point where my wife says, who are you talking to? You're so rude. <laughs> I say, yep, yep, okay, yep, right, okay, well, I'll do that, okay, see, because the conversations are all in conversation. I'm picking up the last conversation we had, and I'm adding back to it, or vice versa. And if I ring him and say, can you do such and such? Yeah, okay, and he, he cuts me off because he's sending it to me. The objective is to give me the solution. <clears throat> so that's how I found my mentor. In terms of marketing strategies, <clears throat> the first thing you have to do is you have to try and acquire a marketing and sales mindset. How will you do that? I recommend that each of you go around to department stores, masquerading that you're going to buy some cosmetics or some other device, and you simply look at how the salesperson goes about selling to you. You're not there to buy the thing, you're there to observe how someone tries to sell you the device. Walk into a used car yard masquerading as a potential buyer and watch as the bees depend upon, the, depend upon the, the pot of honey. Your purpose is to see how they go about approaching you, what their method and technique is, and to absorb, to vaccinate your mind, to start to enrich your mind with how people go about selling. Now into marketing strategies. I just did sales. Now into marketing strategies. It's very simple. Simply find someone who's successful and copy them. Now, I'm a lousy cook. I don't need to cook because I've got my life set up so I very rarely eat at home. I nearly always eat out, and so is my wife. In fact, we didn't use our stove for three years after the book. So, I want to come out standing chef. I would go and find outstanding chefs and copy them. So, the message I'm giving you is go and find anyone who has a marketing strategy in your particular interest area. And if you can't find someone in your interest area, Find anyone who has a marketing strategy in any area and look at how they go about marketing. And the most effective, most powerful marketing technique available to you is word of mouth. And that requires a systematic approach to actually cultivating word of mouth. An example is that if a client were to buy something off you, imagine a client bought some glassware off you, you would wait 48 hours after the sale, part of your systematic approach, because it would cool off in 24 to 48 hours. And after 72 hours, they can't remember your name. Within 48 hours, you contact them. You bought the glassware, yes. Are you happy? Yes. Is it doing all the things you expected to do? Yes. I really enjoyed providing you with the glassware. You must. You are a lovely people to deal with. You must know other people in your circle of friends who would be candidates to buy the glassware. Can, what about your brothers and sisters? What about your mum and dad? What about this? What about that? You cultivate them to systematically think of people that might be potential candidates and ask them for three names and telephone numbers that people might buy. You then ask them to contact those people and tell them you're going to call. Now, when you call those people, before you call them, they will have called that person and said, I've given you a name to so-and-so and they're going to call you. And there's three questions they'll ask this referee. First question, are they any good at what they said they do? Second question, did they deliver on time? Third question, how much did they charge you? Now, those three questions will be asked before you even make the call. When you make the call, it's almost a done deal because they're taking the call because they're interested in finding out more about what this referee has told them. And they already know what you do. They already know whether you're on time. They already know what you charge. Now they're a candidate to buy from you. So that's an example of a marketing strategy, which is word of mouth based and it's systematic. You've got to sit down and actually design your marketing strategy. You can't just hope that if you run around with a shotgun blazing away that something really nice to eat is going to walk in front of the shotgun. You've got to actually have a laser beam approach and decide who you're aiming your services at. And when you make a sale to someone, you've got to build upon that sale to get word of mouth referral to someone else. But if you want inspiration, if you want guidance, if you want insight to marketing strategies, you go to any business anywhere and look at how they market themselves. And you'll get insight and understanding from doing that.
Sonia, from a um, commercial gallery point of view, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, the commercial galleries exist in order to uh, work for the artists and they also work for themselves, but they're that um, in that mediation role between the artist and the client. Artists really, I don't want to say traditionally, but a lot of artists don't want to deal with the money side of things. That's why they get a gallery to work on their behalf. And that's a very tricky relationship to start negotiating and to get to that point where a gallery sees your work as financially viable for them is also very hard work. So you have to do a lot of, um, I would say, groundwork before you get there. Um, and, you know, galleries are really good at this kind of marketing strategy. They're good at nurturing their artists and also their clients. So in a way, if you, and also artists, for artists, from their point of view, you need to put in um, a lot of effort into that relationship with the galleries because if that relationship doesn't work, then it's not, you know, you're not going to have a um, viable practice with them. So, oh, um, I was just, I think the the kind of the gallerist artist collection institution relationship is sort of quite nuanced. Um, so the a, a kind of Direct marketing is potentially a little bit more. It's handled usually potentially a little bit more diplomatic than the the, the cold, you know, the cold call and the or not the cold call, the warm call and the um and the the sell. But I think that marketing strategy is great in terms of you were talking about having a career versus having a um, a sustainable practice. And if you can substitute the word sale with the word opportunity, that's going to work as well. So. The end of the arts industry works of, of networking, and people tend to think about networking as this really um, a kind of, you know, in a kind of negative way. It's like it seems to be, to be a bit nepotistic and a little bit opportunistic. But networking, I think, actually means something quite different. It means something quite different to me because my, I think of my network as my group of peers. So all of the things that I have, I have achieved, all the opportunities I've received have actually come through looking almost right in front of me and also sort of like into the future and, and projecting kind of beyond that and looking at where I would like to be in the future. But your peer group is really important and the people are surrounding your peer group, that kind of the, 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 the kind of the strata out from that are the most important people to you, not, not just for sales, but also for opportunity, com camaraderie, peership, um, influences like all the kind of inspiration all of those kind of things that are important to a sustainable kind of creative industry but it's true it, it that's it, it it works it works like that can i <clears throat> oh sorry can uh, I ask let's go here and then we're going to move along that way yes <laughs> Bronze work towards um, marketing, yes, but um, a lot of my lecturers have kind of um, said that in like small organisations, the marketers are probably the first people to um, accept things like news and coming in. I just don't understand that because I feel like that. Not the door. I don't understand it because I've never been in like, I, yeah, I completely agree with um, like the replacing set of opportunities and stuff, but like I would be. Yeah, so yeah. A quick comment so, for you. Yeah. Marketing is the only activity that brings money in. Yeah. Why would you say that? Yeah, Go I don't understand it. And I do with business news who come to me and say, we can't make payroll, we think about sacking our PR person. Yeah. <laughs> Sit still, do not move. Do not leave the room. You will stay here until I get this through to you. Do not sack your marketing person, you idiot. They're the sole source of your revenue. You will save your way into destruction. So to make a comment about what you've heard, marketing is the only mechanism that brings money into the business. That's all that counts. By the way, would you like me to tell you what my personal marketing budget is? How much do I spend a year on marketing? Anyone want to know? <laughs> My budget is 175 bucks, and I haven't spent it for three years. So how do I do that? Word of mouth. I systematically follow a word of mouth strategy. 
but we're the same advertising. I think we've got one two liner in the yellow page that nobody uses it anymore. Mm -hmm. I should can that. Make a note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have we answered your question? And did we catch you up? Yeah. I can't say from a management side of things, but um, you, as an artist, you're marketing yourself all the time. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm in a group of people. A room full of people. My friends are always like, "Oh, he's talking about his glass again." I'm like, well, "That's what I do. Like, I'm passionate about what I do." And so, if I meet someone, I say, "Yeah, I'm a glass blower. This is what I do. I show them my work." If I walk into a gallery, I say, "Oh, look, this is cool glass. This is what I do." Um, I have an Instagram. I have a Facebook, and I and I use those things as well. You know, I think there's nothing wrong with, with selfless promotion. What is it? Shameless promotion. I just want to reinforce that. Whether you know it or not, whether you know it or not. Every one of you is in sales and marketing, you have been all your life. Mm. You just don't know that. Yeah. And it's time now to bring it up from the subconscious and make it conscious. If you have a love mate, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you have been in sales and marketing. And <laughs> <laughs> Every one of you is in sales and marketing, sales and marketing, whether you know it or not. So bring it up. Accept that's part of your personality. And in fact, if you hadn't been in sales and marketing in all your life, you would have been beaten to death in school yet. So the message I'm giving you is innately, everyone <coughs> that has this as part of their brainstem. You just don't necessarily know. So having a website, for example, where you showcase your work and put your resume up, uh, list, you know, or have images from your exhibitions, that's also one way of marketing. It might not be called marketing, but that's a resource that curators use, that galleries use, that people who want to buy your work use. And very important in today's market. Absolutely, it's absolutely important, and a lot of websites don't cost anything. They just require some effort and good organisation, you know. And also, if you're going to photograph your work, you're going to do it well yeah, because there is yeah. there is nothing worse than photography. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you're going to invest yeah. in anything, it's your tax agent photo. and a photographer. Yeah. you know, yeah. and that's so so important because there's nothing that puts people off more than you know a sculptor who you know is a good sculptor but you see an image of their work that really doesn't do them justice mm -hmm. i see images of my own work i'm like i didn't make that what <laughs> how did you get that oh my God. God. that's so good <laughs> it doesn't look like that when i'm holding it the photos make it look you know? so we, we, yeah, yeah. Well, it kind of flows on from that um i wanted to ask the creators like what's the best practice that you've seen for emerging artists who don't have that relationship yet with the gallery in terms of self-promoting, in terms of marketing, and if there's particular artists whose names you like, check out their website, check out the way they do it, or just practice. So yeah. can I just repeat that for the for anyone that didn't hear that? So this is so when you're coming to a curator, if you're coming to a programmer, can we have some examples of some people who have done it well, some emerging artists that have done it well um, that you guys can give us if you know? I mean, that's that's a really good question. <laughs> um. Yeah, well, you know, if you want to look at someone like Brooke Andrew, for example, he's not an emerging artist, but he's a well-established Australian artist who's with, um, you know, high-end galleries. Um, look at his website. He still has a website. So even though he's represented um, by commercial galleries, and some galleries would not let their artists have their own websites um, because they, they might sell directly to the client. But here's someone who does have his own website but who's also represented by galleries. So, you know, start with him and then you'll you'll slowly kind of um, go from there. But it's it's really important to have something that's really simple. There's no point in having something really complicated. That doesn't get your message across. It shows that, you know, you're a creative thinker, but people already know if they're looking at an artist's website that this person is a creative thinker. Your website shouldn't be your work. It should just be there to show what you can do. So, you know, I mean, I, I can, you know, um, put a list together of the ones that I think are really good and are really successful, but really there's no kind of formula. It's just simple. Look at locally, Rebecca Bauman has a pretty good website. She does, yeah. And a pretty good Instagram feed as well. She doesn't post a lot, but it's she's somebody who has a... A very sort of um, a, a very also very like a likable and approachable presence. Very like the web, website very simple white images. Um, she has two tumblers. Every time she goes in a residency, she keeps a blog of photos that she takes. So it's sort of there's new content, but there's also works, and there's also a really clear different differentiation between research and 
and work as well. Yeah. That's a really, she's a really good one, mm. I think. Um, I'm having, a, I'm having a bit of a blank. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. That's true. It's yeah. good. Yeah. In terms of how to do it, though, I'd also recommend you've got to, you've got to show. You've got to, you've got to, and you, or you have to document work, so you have to install it and at least have it photographed. The best way to, to get noticed is to do it. Really, is yeah. and to do it, to do it reg regularly. Yeah. As well, um, exhibiting is an ex exhibiting your work is also an opportunity to see your work out of the studio. I'm talking really heavily about visual arts, I don't know if you're visual, visual artists, but that will bring you into the public realm. It's the the moment where you kind of meet your public, and it's also a moment for you to reflect on your work. And it's important to do that, I think, more regularly and in different kinds of spaces and contexts as well. And that's how you you become you pick up the the kind of the, the notice of curators and galleries and other galleries and things and by being present um, and by being visible. I think the research thing too, you know, like I have glass galleries, I've got the glass arts gallery in Sydney. I, I'm not allowed to sell my work through anywhere else through Sydney because she markets mm. my stuff all over the world, it takes it to New York, London, Chicago, Singapore, you know, like she'll take my work overseas um, before they close down up the road form and sell my stuff in the front shop and they again, they put my work in Insight magazine, you know. They take 50% commission for a good reason. Um, and, and I guess, and you guys are probably better than this, but I, I would find the galleries that you make work like or similar to or think would represent you well mm -hmm. and, and approach them. Go in with, with a nice portfolio and good photographs of your work and a good website and say, look, I'm professional, this is what I do. And, you know, you might get knocked back a few times, but don't give up because, you know, I've made work that I, I put in a show and think, God, oh, that's never going to sell. And I can't believe people buy it, like really. Like I'm like those colours are hideous, I didn't mean to do those, but I keep pushing through it because you know, we analyse as again as artists, like we analyse things way more than we should. We never have confidence in our own work, you know. I still don't consider myself an artist and I, and I probably should, you know. But my advice is to exhibit as much as you can, enter competitions, believe in yourself and put it out there and just because you get knocked down, don't don't lie on the ground, get back up again. Keep doing it. It's what you're supposed to do. I think all of this is transferable to other art forms as well. I know there are um, it's, there's a lot of different art forms in this space. You know, even looking at if you're an independent artist, and especially emerging, we've got an incredible resource of the Blue Room Theatre, um, and documenting your work there as well. So if you have a performance piece, if you have a musical piece, um, that you you're documenting that in a professional manner as well. So there's also about, sorry photographers no. who are trying to establish their careers who would do things for you for free because that adds to their portfolio. Mm -hmm. So seek out professional photographers who are also at the beginning of their career who are who will gladly document, yeah, document yeah. your work. Yeah. And seek out marketing consultants, <laughs> not just galleries, but marketing consultants, and offer them a clip, 50% was mentioned, which in my opinion is very high. That's, but a, standard that's standard for a gallery. gallery. That's a gallery's yeah. commission. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Standard. As, as a business advisor, my first reaction is, is to negotiate the gallery. That's a nice <laughs> we, we can take yeah, that off the table. <laughs> but my point is, be good at being an artist and get someone who's good at marketing to represent you and give them a piece of the income. No income, no payment. Double income, no <coughs> payment. They can't lose. If they're really good at what they'll do, they can do it. I think you said before as well, you have a you have a plan, you have a goal, you know what your goal is, and, and people say to me all the time, you know, oh your eggs, they sell all over you know the world and why don't you make little plastic ones that we can mass produce them and we can make millions of dollars on them and I look at them with a blank face going, why? Like I don't get it. I don't I don't need personally, I don't need to have a lot of money. I'm happy with what I have and I'm lucky that they sell, but I don't want to take my work to the let's say even banksy level. Like I'm just not that's not I would never try to be put or put glass in that world. So you know how you want to market yourself is how I guess you want to, you know how you it's want to. It's about defining your ideas. Yeah, 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 exactly. Your, exactly. your individual ideas. So yeah, you might exactly. want to sell a million eggs. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. That, you just need to know that's why you're doing it and not get surprised when yeah, you know, it, it takes you in a different direction. And, you know, sometimes I make a piece of glass, I'm like, oof, that is, that is terrible. I'm not going to make any more of them. You, know, <laughs> you break it. Be able to, yeah, be able to go and chuck that on the ground and let's do something else. You know, sometimes people aren't going to like everything you do. Like, that's part of the world too. Take, be able to take criticism, I guess. Like, Can we, sorry, guys, I'm just conscious of time. We've got 15 minutes left to keep it open to you guys. We had another question over there. Was it yeah, in the black? It might be gone now because it was a while back. Um, but I just wanted to add to the, um, the thing of, like, Marketing work, I guess. Um, I'm a recent graduate and I've done a degree in marketing and art, so I've been better too. Um, so I guess I'm kind of 
um, and I'm starting out, but I just like to kind of vouch for like educating myself, like in public um, in relations and that sort of stuff. And like, um, I did a degree in public relations, and for people that don't know what that is, it's kind of like a way of um, using marketing for free. So, um, like, listen to your TED talks, go on YouTube, like, go to TAFE, all that sort of stuff, like, go and find out a bit more about it. And, like, that's a way that artists can use like, marketing advertising for free. Yeah, great, thank you. Still, yes, yeah, still very relevant, thank you. Yes, um, I've got a question for Brian. What was your favourite subject? My favourite subject? <laughs> Probably nothing. What was your best subject? Oh, what was my best subject? That's my question. Oh, sorry, I thought that my favourite was the question. Yeah, yeah. and then yeah, and now I've got another one. Finance. <laughs> and what was your worst? <laughs> Probably interpersonal skills. What's <laughs> um, your? Interpersonal. Um, my wife spent a lot of time working me around <laughs> and fixing me up. Um, I tended, when I met her, I, I've been married for 31 years and we were a couple for six years before uh, we got married and she spent those six years getting me ready for the wedding day. <laughs> uh, and I tended to be someone who didn't listen and took over the conversation. I know this comes as a surprise. <laughs> I, I would project myself into the conversation and not hear the other person and she spent six years battering me into you have to learn to listen. So I think my worst subject was interpersonal skills. I think that's pretty important in our industry as well. You've got to learn to listen whether you're sitting, you're sitting down with your mentor, whether you're sitting in with a, one of our arts organisations that are available to you. Um, anything around the corner that I've missed? No? Yeah? Um, yeah. I've got a question about investment, um, uh, about uh, kind of what kind of rate you should invest in yourself. Like I've been building my business for probably three years now. Um, starting from making a loss and then breaking even. Now I've got a little bit of a egg that I've been working on. So now I'm at the point where I'm trying to invest, like starting to put money back into my business. And like I don't take a wage. I kind of like my day job is my pays a mortgage and stuff. And then I have my yeah, just keep my egg to invest in my business. Do you have any advice about um, at what rate to do that, or when is too much or too little? <clears throat> Want like I've had good return on most of my investment, but now I'm at like, oh, am I putting too much in? Or well, you, you say what you're going to say, and then if I can enhance it, I'll say something. Did too. everyone hear the question? Yeah. Yep. How, how much do you invest in yourself? And I, I treated your question as a, as a monetary question. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm all in. Like. Okay. Time here's, here's a very simple solution. Yeah. <laughs> For every dollar you spend on your car, spend a dollar on yourself by way of investment in yourself. Yeah. So. Your, your running your car is going to cost you two or three thousand bucks a year if it's not on finance, just running costs. So, therefore, your budget for investing in yourself is two or three grand a year. That investment may include buying professional advice around some things you need to do, or buying a learning program and what you want to do, or buying a, a, a you know, computer program to help you do. So, the message I'm giving you is if you buy yourself a really expensive car, it's because you invested in yourself in a your cheap car. And you keep matching the investment. Whatever you spend on the car is what you spend on yourself. Yeah. Because the car is a depreciating asset and you're an appreciating asset. Yeah. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you come into the world naked. You leave the world wearing a shroud. You can't take it with you. The only real asset you'll ever have between now and the day you die is the grey matter between your ears. And the investment in that grey matter is the greatest investment you'll ever make. Good. Is that, the, is that the answer you wanted? Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, um, yeah. Well, I would have said, the only yeah. thing I can add to that is that um, because we're all different, it is about personal goal. Mm -hmm. And so if your business made nothing, then broke even, and now you're making something, what you do with that money really comes down to personal goal. Mm -hmm. It could be in yourself. It could be in a new asset. Maybe t partly tax deductible with your twenty thousand write-off. Thinking about that. <laughs> but it could be to accumulate in a term deposit for some other goal, some other financial goal, mm -hmm. whether that be a holiday or some other thing that you're you're aiming at. So, and it's a difficult question to answer, really, because yeah. we're all so very different. My instinct is to, and always has been, um, uh, to work hard, 
to accumulate. I don't know what I'm accumulating for because my goals keep changing. It keeps moving all the way through my life. It morphs into something else. But that instinctively, I work hard, accumulate for something. And then along the way, hopefully I find what it is that I'm after. Okay. But um, that's the only point that I would make. Mm -hmm. And and I um I like to have a surplus. And fortunately, all of my artists, be they visual or performing artists, uh, have been relatively successful um, in their eyes. And some of them have made a lot of money. Some of uh, one of my my uh, public arts. Is that, the, is that the word for them? People that do public installations? Yeah, yeah. Terribly successful. Um, in my eyes, they don't make a lot of money, but they're very happy. They're very happy with what they do, and they're very happy with the, the their financial reward. Um, and, and some of my performing artists do very well, and others probably not Need so some well. <laughs> well, actually... Maybe, but also at the same time, that, that's why I mentioned at the beginning, you need to consider your sustainable practice and your career as two parallel things mm. and you really need to nurture your art. So we talk about, you know, art as you just have talent and then you do it. You sit down and come up with a marketing plan and then you do all these things. But really, you know, to be a good writer, you need to keep writing. Mm. To be a good artist, you also need to keep working. To be a good musician, you need to keep playing and you need to keep practicing. So... You know, when you talk about investing in yourself, I think you really need to invest in your craft because for a lot of artists, all they can do is make their art. You know, just like all I could see myself doing was art history and curating and working in some sort of capacity in the art. So really, you have to be mindful of not what you're selling but what your career is. And if you think about it as a career, then all of these marketing strategies all of these business plans they will come together you know you also need to come up with really good time management um and you know use applications use all these other things you know come up with a system that works for you not everyone is the same not everyone's a morning person not everyone's a you know a night person. well really you know you need to come up with something that works for you and and construct your life so that it, you can actually make those things happen but, you know, your art is your, your thing, you know. There's no point in, you know, paying so much for photos um, to be done and for a website when really you're not spending time and effort and energy into making you work or, you know, um, progressing your ideas. I think it's what you said. There's a line. Is art a job you have or is it a lifetime that you decide to dedicate to? Because... You know, I think it's awesome that in the first couple of years you're making money off what you create, and if you can do that, not it right. doesn't matter how much it is, though. To me, you know, again, yeah. it depends on what what it is that you value. You know, mm. yeah. the fact that you can create and make money from it, you know, that's that's what puts a smile on my face. That's awesome. I think, like for me, the financial um, making when I started to make money is when I could actually do more art and take a five-day job down to a four-day and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, like yeah, yeah. so making yeah. money for me is not so much like soul-destroying corporate like it's freeing yeah. to my art practice but like it's, well, I I totally retail on the same for page. 14 years yeah. I've worked in skate shops surf shops video yeah. stores and, and I love retail I know how to sell you know back to front yeah. <laughs> but I don't <laughs> like it love retail. You know, <laughs> end of the time yeah and I've only last year definitely to bed and, and like the reward I get I get I, I'm at school at eight in the morning I'll leave at three I have like four or five hours mm -hmm. at most of a day. I get $30 yeah. a day at base public education rate. Right? That's yeah. I do two of that a week, and that's my rent. A couple of weeks pay. I get three days, four days, weekends to work on my own stuff. Awesome. You know? There is a pretty good argument for being in the world and experiencing a lot of different yeah. things, and engaging in the workforce in, in the workforce outside of your art practice does that. So all of those interactions that you have and all of those other skills that you learn will all feed back into your the art kids practice. The kids inspire me. They give me yeah. ideas. You know, you, you can get inspiration yeah, from any other place. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> everything I've been doing for the last year has all been year seven. Ideas. Yeah, year seven. Because they don't know how to argue that. <laughs> no, no, no. But no, they actually give me ideas. The yeah. things they say or things that they draw, you know, it's not what they're doing. But I'm like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I might do that. They're not like schooled yet. No, yeah. And, and I think as well, like, you know, like my boss said to me, you know, to be an artist, it, it, it is, you don't be an artist until you're in your 30s because art is experiencing life and, Really, what does an 18 to a 25-year-old 
really know about about life. They're, they're experiencing. That's why they're learning. That's part of growing up, you know. Yeah. So I think it's once you reach your thirties and, and your forties that you really make your art. I think a successful sort of well established, you know, career. It's it's a long time. Right? Yeah. So I can do a three year art degree. Sweat, my artist. <laughs> Done and dusted. Cool. Well, timing wise, and I think also just how where we've ended up with our conversation, I think this is a really beautiful place to leave it. Um, I know that there are still more of you guys that have some questions. Um, I don't know about these guys, but I'm going to try and head over to the bird. There's bed, bare face stories. It's about to start up over there, and that was a Y culture thing. So I'm going to go and try and support that. So you may be able to catch some of these guys over there um, and and bombard them with some questions then. Otherwise, of course, we've got some contact details for Jeff. Um, and if you've still got any more questions, please hit us up on our Facebook page, post them up on there, and direct them to wherever you want to um, direct them to. And we'll try and get the message over to these guys, and I'm sure these guys are going to be happy to, to spend a few minutes replying. Thank you very much for everybody um, coming, and uh, please spread the word. Let people know about the rest of the this season. We are going to be doing regular talks. Um, once a month, I hope, the last Tuesday of every month. Um, a big thank you as well to State Theatre Centre for giving us this space for um, our workshop conversation tonight. And a big uh, thank you for our, our core sponsor, Department of Culture and the Arts, as well. I'm just going This is our. Oh, sorry. Yep. I've got my phone number. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in the room has a perpetual invitation between now and humanity. To ring me on my phone number at any time and ask me any question about starting, running, expanding, selling their business at any point between now and the end of your life. If you ask me a question I cannot answer, I'll send you a hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so far, no one's got the money. You're welcome to drop. Business question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank Oh, I don't have it on me right now. Zero four one two. Uh oh. <laughs> double four eight two. Zero four one two. Double nine double four eight two. Try your luck. See if you can get a hundred bucks. If anybody did miss that, you can send me an email and I'll flick it through to you by an email. Don't forget, Propeller here to be able to answer questions for you guys as well. Big round of applause to our panel, guys. Thank you. Very much.